Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce this exciting panel on the year in Lear, featuring my colleague at Columbia, Professor James Shapiro, and writer Preeti Taneja. Uh, it is probably no exaggeration to say that Shakespeare's enduring presence is as marked in India as in any other country, including England. Translated into numerous Indian languages and reworked into various adaptations, ranging from films to novels, Shakespeare's plays continue to speak to the Indian imagination and provide a lens to interpret India's convulsive political and social order. The familiar Shakespearean plot lines of a Macbeth or an Othello or a King Lear have an almost archetypal power in elucidating subtle changes in the fabric of social relations in contemporary India, which might explain why Indian adaptations of Shakespeare remain so prolific. Priti Taneja's new novel, We That Are Young, is one such modernist elaboration of what many critics regard as Shakespeare's greatest tragedy, King Lear. I hesitate to use the word rewriting because what Preeti does is to let Shakespeare play out in the Indian context, specifically in Delhi of uh, 2012, and discovers therein a new way of telling the tale of inheritance, corporate power, and rampant corruption from the perspective of the daughters. Preeti Taneja is a UK-based journalist and human rights reporter who has worked in Iraq, Rwanda, Jordan, and Kosovo, often at the front line of human tragedy. Her work has been published in The Guardian and New Statesman. She has also taught creative writing and continues to write, I be, uh, teach, I believe, creative writing in prisons, and she has campaigned for the rights of migrant workers. We That Are Young received the Desmond Elliott Prize for new fiction. She will be joined in conversation with my friend, and colleague in the English department at Columbia, James Shapiro. Jim is among the most renowned Shakespeare scholars writing today, and his enduring interest in the global reach of Shakespeare has connected him to some of the leading reinterpreters of Shakespeare around the world, and especially in India. He is the Larry Miller Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia, and the author of numerous books, too many to name here in their entirety, but I would like to single out Shakespeare and the Jews, uh, 1599, A Year in the Life of William Shakespeare, A Contested Will, Who Wrote Shakespeare, um, and 1606, The Year of Lear. All these books have won major um, book awards. Um, Jim is that rare academic who is equally adept at speaking to specialists in his field and the general public. He is a public intellectual who takes his passion for Shakespeare far and wide. So it's really my, uh, my uh, great pleasure to welcome Jim and uh, Preeti um, to uh, embark on this conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. And I hope, Gowrie, you're going to join the conversation. I think we'll have a few minutes if we do at the end to open it up to your questions as well. Uh, I want to thank you. We've been colleagues for a long time. And Gowrie is the most distinguished of my departmental colleagues and one who I have enormous uh, reverence for and respect for your scholarship and teaching. We've just met. We met in an elevator about 40 minutes ago. And there's nothing like the excitement of two people who've spent a decade of their lives on Shakespeare's King Lear getting to meet and talk. And thanks to the invitation uh, by uh, Jaipur, and, and by Gowrie to participate, I had the really exciting experience of, of reading We That Are Young. And I, I read a lot of adaptations of Shakespeare into mostly modern Anglo-American novels. And they tend to be uh, impressive, but fairly tepid. And when I come to We That Are Young, uh, I came to, you call it a translation, an adaptation, you can describe it yourself, an extraordinary reimagining of King Lear in a culture and a cultural moment that resonates so powerfully, it is as exciting for me as coming upon 
Lear for the first time, if you will. And I'm just curious why, how you had, since you're a lot younger than I, had the ambition to take on King Lear and uh, rework it in, in this way. Well, I think, for me, King Lear is a puzzle, and I still don't feel, even though I've finished the novel and it's out, that I have quite solved it in any way. But it's a puzzle that's completely obsessed me since I was probably 17 years old, and I first studied it at school. Um, and it was the first time I had really seen a partition narrative in which women are the kind of pawns in the game, and everything to do with female honor and shame is, was expressed there in the classroom and talked about in a way that suddenly I could see um, an Indian extended family, um, which didn't really ever have room in the classroom um, in the UK where I grew up. So that was deeply exciting for me. Um, and the idea just never went away. It just kept on in the back of my mind. And I always thought one day I'm going to see if I can take this play and make sense of it in, in the world in which I was growing up in, which was partly in the UK and partly in India. But when I started writing The Year of Lear, it was a decade before Brexit. And of course, by the time I finished the book, Brexit had exploded. And Shakespeare's play famously begins with the division of the kingdom with partition. And seeing that reimagined in the 1940s context and the after effects of uh, partition was very exciting for me. And reading your novel also brought me back to the creation of King Lear uh, sometime in 1605 or 1606 when it was first staged. And my students are always interested in where Shakespeare got his ideas for his plays. And I, I always disappoint them when I explain that he didn't get his ideas for his plays. He took somebody else's story and did a gut renovation of that story. And in the case of King Lear, he took a play called King Lear that had been an Elizabethan play that was a bit stale, a bit tired, and didn't speak to his cultural moment. And 15 years or so after that play had first been written, maybe 10 years, he offers a completely new version of it no longer with a happy ending, with a, a devastating conclusion, but updating it to a Jacobean moment. So I feel as if you are doing something very Shakespearean. I don't know if you feel this as well, which is taking something that is admittedly, after 400 years or so, a bit tired and doesn't <laughs> speak with the greatest immediacy to issues of Shame, Sharam, if I'm not mispronouncing the word, that just popped for me when I read your novel, and those issues that, that seem to matter in contemporary India. I don't know if I feel like the play itself was tired, but because the language is just so immediate and it's so compelling. So on the page, the play never gets old. But I hadn't seen anything that had really kind of pulled out the nuances of, for example, dowry, which is still a really contentious issue, even though it's not legal to um, have dowry in contemporary India anymore. It's still a really contentious issue, and women do die over this. It, it can brutalize families. So, so that whole idea of who gets which bit of the kingdom, which daughter is going to be the one who inherits the best part of the kingdom, um, is, is predicated on this idea of dowry and withholding dowry. It is seen as, as their due from their father, and they have to beg for it, essentially. So there was a lot there that I wanted to get into, and, um, and it's really exciting when you start to look at the real world and ask yourself, how does literature express the real world, but also how is literature formed? And one of the things I wanted to ask you was, when you came to write 1606, was it because of the mysteries in the play that you wanted to solve? Like, where did these ideas come from? Or was it because you knew about this world and you could see that, you know, somehow the play had come out? Of yeah. I, I, I had spent, before writing this book, 15 years researching writing a book called 1599. Yeah. And I began that as a young man and finished it as a not-so-young man. <laughs> and that ended with Hamlet. And Hamlet is K2. But Lear is the highest 
Himalayan and I didn't get to the top. I don't know if you felt if you, if you uh, reached the top of this. And I thought, I've been doing this a long time. I'm pretty good. Let's see if I could summit on King Lear. And I got to the point where I ran out of oxygen in a way <laughs> after 10 years of researching and writing this book. But I, I live back then. I know what the weather was like in late September 1606. And I, I feel... I tried to feel what contemporaries of Shakespeare felt in terms of their anxieties, in the same way that I'm feeling today. Is there going to be testimony in front of uh, the Senate on Monday or not? And I'm sure many of you feel that anxiety. Shakespeare wrote plays in which there was no competing media. Going back to Martin Puchner's talk earlier, he's not writing this. This play is not published first. It's staged for an audience. Some of the people are illiterate. But a play that speaks to the deep concerns of a culture. There's no competing media uh, other than bear baiting or public executions. Plays are it. And uh, he's speaking to 2,000 or 3,000 Londoners about the things that matter to them. Right. When I teach King Lear now, to my students, they're interested in it for all kinds of reasons, but usually not because it speaks to them in the same way that I think your novel will speak to them. You spoke a little bit about the daughters and dowry, but there's also a political side to this novel, and I'd love for you to spell out a little bit the ways in which this spoke and speaks to the political anxieties of India today, Kashmir today, because uh, some of the novel crucial parts are set there as well. Well, the book really begins with this division, um, historical division of, of, of India that happened in 1947, as you all know. And, but we catch up with this family, and they are a hotel-owning family. They are hugely wealthy. They have got fingers in every pie from media to politics to um, industry. And so, in many ways, like you said, they're an archetypal family of wealth. And this book begins where that company is about to be broken into pieces between the three daughters. But because of the kind of connection between this humongous, hungry capitalism and the country, the land, the actual physical land, um, which was sort of divided in the first place, I, had, I wanted to find a way to express that with some kind of contested territory. King Lear begins with this partition and it ends with a civil war in the cliffs of Dover over a segment of land that's fought over. And for me, that place is Kashmir. So all through the novel, all of the action, just like in the play, is driving towards that contested territory where this hotel-owning family is trying to start a seven-star luxury hotel. And it's basically um, on the site of a conflict zone. What they want to do is illegal. It's not allowed. You can't buy land there. You can't build like that there. But because they have so much money and they have all of this kind of history and they want to make a mark with their family name, um, that is what they decide to do. Um, so by the end of it, it it's sort of at, in Kashmir with the hotel opening. And this is a state which is still under a huge amount of siege. Um, people are really struggling there, and they have been for seven years, uh, 70, seven decades. What I like about Shakespeare's King Lear is the way it is both a political play and a familial play. Yeah. And when I see it in production, usually a director chooses to go with one or the other. And increasingly, because it's a play about an old man, uh, it's staged as a kind of Alzheimer's play, for, for better and for worse. But those productions tend to downplay the political. Were you aware while constructing your novel that you were trying to maintain the plays, if you will, original balance or interweaving of the two? I don't think, I think it's dishonest, actually, to try to interpret this play and let, let King Lear off and say, oh, he's just genuinely going mad in a sort of demented sense, and if he was diagnosed, then what would we do? You know, because Shakespeare doesn't come, t come down on whether or not this is a clinical madness. It's just mad. It's, he is going, he, he contains within him, this character of Lear in the play, contains this madness within him, and I don't believe for a second that this is a play about one person on a hero's narrative, which ends in this kind of tragic death um, redemption sort of thing. I, I think it's a social tragedy. 
Um, it's very convenient in many ways to say, oh, it's just about this foolish, fond old man, and we love him really. But if we are really thinking about this play as kind of a correlation between our political moment and what Shakespeare is doing, then are we going to let those people off? Yeah. The timing of this book is also fortuitous, but also makes me think that Lear, you know, the, the stock of Shakespeare's plays go up and down. And there's a wonderful book by a scholar uh, named Reg Folks that is called Hamlet versus Lear. And his argument is Hamlet has always been the most popular play. And for a moment in the post-Holocaust, post-Cold War moment, Lear almost took over, but Hamlet reassumed its preeminence. And I think we are now living in a Lear moment. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to be going over to London to see Ian McKellen's Lear this week. And this week, uh, Glenda Jackson uh, gave notice that she'll be playing King Lear on stage on Broadway as she had in London last year. I, I think Lear is the play now that speaks to this moment in, in ways that even Hamlet doesn't. And you started this a very long time ago, but clearly the play spoke to you in ways that other plays did not. But don't you find that when you look at the moment now, and you started 1606, you know, way before Brexit, but do you get a sense of vertigo now when you think about what this play is doing and our current moment? Do you feel like this wheel has come full circle in a way? So to speak, lifting uh, that line uh, <laughs> uh, uh, out of Shakespeare. I, I do, but I also have to admit that there are things in your novel that were only in the periphery of my reading of Lear. Environmentalism matters hugely in, in, in your work. Uh, your image of India as a, uh, 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 an heirloom silk carpet that's frayed a bit made me understand, in a sense, the challenge of tradition and modernity in the same moment. These are things that are in the play but have to be activated by a fresher, you know, this, this novel is called We That Are Young because it focuses on the young characters in King Lear, Edgar and Edmund and the daughters, rather than the aged folk who get their role in it. Could you talk a little bit about why you chose that title and how the focus on the young shifts our understanding of, of the play just a bit? I would love to, yeah. I mean, India has got a huge young demographic, 50% um, of the population, I think it is, is under 25, and that's a huge, huge number of people who are inheriting a legacy of uh, socialism that's turned into a kind of a different kind of capitalism via sort of state of emergency, and the, the, bene the kind of impact of that, those economic changes in this relatively short space of time, 70, 71 years, has had huge effect. And that's something that I really think about a lot, you know, the ways in which money shapes our narratives and shapes, shapes our lives and shapes who we think we should be in terms of our own families and in terms of nation states. So I really wanted to explore that. And that last lines of the play um, ended up being my jumping off point. So we that are young shall never see so much nor live so long. It's, it's, it's not it's not coming down on one side or the other at that moment. The character who speaks those lines isn't saying, oh, I'm going to follow in the footsteps of my father and my grandfather and my godfather and make sure that I uphold the things that they stood for because we could see through Lear's own eyes that those things were not very good. Um, and nor is he saying, I'm going to go completely the other way and I'm going to save the world. Um, he just sits on the fence very carefully and it was really that interesting sort of ambivalence that I wanted to think through these five young people in the play. Well, you really, I mean, your handling of those characters is extraordinary. And we were talking a bit about how the, construct, the construction of the play is so rock solid that it enables this kind of adaptation or translation without dips or disappointments along the way. Were there things that you couldn't tuck into the novel that you wanted to or tried to? Yeah, I mean, the novel form does force you to do different things that can be, um, can be done in theatre, especially Renaissance theatre, which um, allows people to never notice that someone is in disguise, for example. You know, we can't get away with that in novels in quite the same way. Yeah. So um, 
a little detail of that is that um, one of the characters, Kent, who disguises himself as his master's servant, so he takes himself off and, from a nobleman into a very rough and ready type of chap. But so I split those two characters. It just wasn't working until, uh, you know, the very last minute. The editors were just like, this isn't working, and, you know, no one's going to believe that, this, that everyone simply doesn't realize that this is actually Kent. Um, n novels ask us to do that, I think, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the mark of a, a really good Shakespeare adaptation is it's not just a pleasurable read, which this is, but also <laughs> illuminates the play. And uh, it's rare that I find a novel truly illuminating a play. Jane Smiley, of course, famously did this with King Lear in A Thousand Acres, and I put that in that company, and that was a wonderful novel, but a very American novel, Midwestern novel. And uh, maybe it just takes uh, somebody who's not a guy to see into the family <laughs> dynamics and the tensions between the daughters, which are beautifully handled here. Well, I mean, you know, I find it very unusual. Like, sometimes I get accused of being a sort of bad feminist because the girls in my book um, end up at loggerheads. But this is how patriarchy operates. It sets people up in a kind of divide and rule, um, especially women, to fight each other for land. So, um, or for money or for whatever it is, for each other, for, for love. Essentially, it's for love. And that is something that I really wanted to illuminate by showing how these sisters always want to try to find a way back to each other. And what was fascinating to me um, with, with King Lear itself is that Cordelia, almost her last lines in the play are that she wants to see her sisters. And maybe she wants to see them so she can look them in the eye and say, look what you've done. But for me, in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking that maybe this is her last bid to try to get back into some kind of connection with them. Um, but, of course, it's a tragedy. It's, it's a heroic tragedy in a way, and, and it's too late. So, um, you know, it, it, I wanted to follow what Shakespeare was sort of telling me all the way through this, and that's how it ends. Yeah. One of the, one of the, the wonderfully serendipitous things about being part of the, the Jaipur Literary Festival and hearing earlier talks is the way that they trigger recollections of uh, things that I wrote about in the book and things that yeah. happened... 400 years ago in, in, uh, in England. And when Shakespeare uh, would have gone to court and seen King James, who was the monarch who came to see this play in December 1606 at court in London, James would more than likely have been wearing this gorgeous jewel on his hat. And it was called the Mirror of Britain or the Mirror of Great Britain. And it was made of four spectacular diamonds, each one of which represented one of his kingdoms, England, Scotland, Wales, and France, even though uh, England had lost France and still claimed that it had it. And that French jewel was a diamond. And that was the Sansi diamond, not the Kohenor diamond. But it was a 14th century discovered diamond in India that had been brought to France in, in, I'm sorry, in the 15th century that James purchased to wear as an emblem of what he thought his political kingdom was. So this idea that there's a firewall between East and West, between India and England or Britain at this time, is only a product of history books that don't want to tease out those connections, pre-Victorian, uh, pre-18th century connections. But there is that as well. So there's something wonderful in the closing of the circle, if you will, yeah. by taking a product of that moment and turning it into, if you will, an Indian King Lear. Thank you. And you know what 1606 really shows as well is just how symbiotic the relationship between the real world as it is and creativity actually is. I mean, was there anything that you found out while you were doing this research for this book that surprised you? Um, I'm ashamed to say how much I didn't know. One of the challenges of immersing yourself in a period is stumbling across things that you had no idea about. And I suppose that... Uh, that crown jewel, if you will, and its constituent parts. I think of Shakespeare as the mirror of Britain. Uh, one of the things that I found out along the way is that fantasy of a great Britain that we see crumbling before us 
as we speak was played out in the fate of that diamond. King James uh, could not create uh, a union of Scotland and England. That partition, if you will, remained. And uh, he had to hawk that jewel and sell off constituent diamonds from it. And I think there's a story in that as well that resonates with, if you will, the yes, there is the uh, political, and yes, there is the familial and domestic, both of which are covered in your novel so beautifully, but they're sutured together by the economic. Yep. And your book is richly detailed on every economic nook and cranny of, of, of Indian society today, how much something costs, what is the value, how do you accumulate the different social strata, and what kind of economic possibilities are, are open to them. I set the book very much in this sort of very recognizable world, but Shakespeare actually sets his play completely outside um, the court of King James and the time he was in. Why did he do that? I'm gonna turn yep. it over to Gallery um, at this point. I know we are, is, we're, we're closing in on Q&A. Okay. Uh, I just on. had a quick question following up on what you said about uh, symbiosis. Um, in, in, in writing your novel about uh, contemporary uh, India um, and, and, and uh, noting the tremendous changes that are, uh, are going on at the level of um, you know, social change and political change, um, did you go back to King Lear and find something new in the play that you might not have actually noted at the at, in your initial reading of Lear? In other words, did India become a lens through which you were able to reinterpret King Lear? Gosh, that's a really good question. Um, I think the play was so familiar to me by the time I started to write that I discovered more and more about India through the play. Um, looking at it the other way, it really is in the kind of realities of contemporary India where I began to understand just what was at stake in King Lear. I wrote my storm scene while there was an actual kind of horrendous monsoon. It was just washing everything away outside my window while I was writing. And I think, you know, when you watch that on the stage, especially on the Anglophone stage, it's often sort of three people, men, wandering around. And under light, a sprinkler. Under a sprinkler, right, and some lighting effects. But when you actually see the damage to people who have nothing, that this kind of weather can do. It just completely changes the way you think about what Shakespeare was trying to say. Um, we can see our Heath scene, again, it's always very bleak, completely unstaged. It's, it's a kind of trope in Western theatre, but Russian uh, leers, for example, often will have basis beggars, crowds of people. Um, for example, in the film Coral Lear, you see actual beggars in the hobble with Lear. And he's still kind of looking around going, you know, wherever they are, that by the pelting of this pitiless storm, as if he still can't quite see them. Um, you know, so I really began to realize what Shakespeare's world might have looked like when I was looking at yeah. um, India. And that storm that. scene is extraordinary it in is. the ways in which you work in, oh. not, not to spoil it alert for those of you who are going to go read it now, but the exploitation of a storm to sexually abuse a lower caste woman, a uh, girl, I should say, at that time, was another one of these details that I thought was brilliant and, and, and truly Shakespearean. Yeah, that was what also interested me, whether the culture of misogyny that you depict in the novel um, you know, uh, requires us to actually go back to the play to look for right. you know, something that uh, is mirrored. Um, the curse is in the book um, that it is impossible to try to match Shakespeare's poetry, and that's something that clearly no one can do, um, and least of all me. So what I did with um, the misogyny is that I went back to the Indian sacred text, and I went through um, a bunch of translations, and I went looking for where women are talked about. And so all of the curses in the play, that Lear, in the novel that uh, my Lear character, Dev Raj, uses are actually taken out of... Mm the laws of Manu, and they're taken out of the Upanishads, and they're taking, taken out and, and of, of the Vedas, because these are the stories and these are the myths that construct our culture. And if they are there and we aren't aware of them, then they are working on us in ways that we can never, we can never expose. 
So, you know, the, the book really tries to weave in similar threads of misogyny that existed in the Renaissance world and through Shakespeare's voice. I don't know if you can tell us any more about how Shakespeare got those horrible curses that he levels against women. But for me, I found those words and that language in the sacred text. Should we open it up? Questions from the audience? Mm -hmm. Yes, if you bring up the lights a little bit, yeah, we'll be able to, to see you as well. Uh, if somebody takes a mic and asks a question, that'd be great. Oh, hi, I'm Antra. Um, I'm, a, I'm a student at Columbia. Actually, two of my professors are on stage there, which is really cool for me. Um, but, um, Mr. Nija, you'd spoken about how um, Lear is set in this place outside the court. It's a very stark setting. And I like most Shakespearean plays, um, a lot of Lear is based really on the relationships between the characters. So when you chose to set your novel in a very materialistic setting, in a very full setting um, as it is, why did you choose to do that, to change the setting so radically? And what effect did that have on the relationships between the characters and the focus that Lear places on each of the individual characters and the networks between them? I think the, first, the answer to the first part of your question is that because it's a novel, it has to have a kind of re realized three-dimensional setting. It's not like people can look at the page. And I mean, you know, one could write just three or four lines a page and use that white space to express something about nothingness or whatever it is. But frankly, if I was doing that, then I would simply be taking the, a play text that already exists and what would I be doing with it? Because that is what it looks like on the page. When that comes to be realized on stage, you can do whatever you like with it, but it's just gone into tradition that it's done in this very stark way. Um, the answer to your second question is that by creating, by having five characters that all look at this lives very differently, I can play with ideas of what truth is and who gets to tell the story. Um, Shakespeare does that himself in the play. Um, that, is, that is the nature of plays. It's, it's sort of polyphonic in, in a sense, if you like. It's got these many voices, and they all compete for our attention. So, you know, I wanted to try to explore some of that, and you have to do that structurally. Any more questions? We can take another question. We've got about five minutes. There's one on the right. Yeah, this might come out as probably like a slightly different question. Uh, Vishal Bharadwaj has made three movies in India, Othello, Ma, Macbeth, and Hamlet. So when you were writing this book, Preeti, did you have this in mind at any point of time? You might be approached by him? Let, before, you give, <laughs> before you give your answer... For what? <laughs> let me... One of the things that we could have spoken about and we were speaking about upstairs is even as there are novelistic adaptations of Shakespeare, there are cinematic ones as well. And having seen those films that you described, Indian cinema right now seems to have the edge in adaptations of Shakespeare. For many, I suspect, of the same reasons we've been discussing your, your, your novel's excellent quality. So I'll let you finish that answer. Um, well, actually, you know, this book was written from 2010 to 2013, and I was very, very relieved when I realized, when I was doing my field research, I was in Trinagar, and I heard a rumor that a filmmaker was coming to um, scout for locations for his next Shakespeare adaptation. Um, and it was on the grapevine that he was going to do the air. And when I found out it was actually Hamlet, I was just, thank I was just so <laughs> thankful. Because obviously that film came out, Heather, it came out way before my book was finished. Um, 2014. Yes, right. And it is an extraordinary film. If you haven't seen it, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, it really gets into the human rights issues and takes, and takes a huge critique of the international community as well as exposing the plight of the people who live there. Um, so, yeah, so I have met Vishal Bhardwaj a few times. Uh, he is now making much ado. No, he's making Twelfth Night. He's about to make Twelfth Night. So he's moving on to comedies. <laughs> I think we're out of time. Uh, we can take one we can more. Take, we can take one more question. In the back on the left, it looks like. Does somebody have a hand up? Or I can't see. No. Well, let me take the opportunity to, again, thank Gowrie and thank, thank you. you. One of the great things about uh, the Jaipur Literary Festival is, uh, in my experiences there, 
I always meet people I otherwise would never meet that change the course of my own work. So I suspect this is one of those meetings, and I'm grateful to uh, uh, JLF for that. Thank you. Thank you.